Hello, and welcome to How to Protect Your Growing Digital Presence. On behalf of our president, Ron Busby, our board chambers, and our staff, thank you for attending. I'm Tiffany Ahelor, Outreach Specialist with the U.S. Black Chambers Incorporated, affectionately known as the National Voice of Black Businesses. We represent over 140 Black Chambers of Commerce and small businesses across the nation and are founded on five pillars of service advocacy, access to capital, contracting, entrepreneurial training, and chamber development. This series was crafted in collaboration with our Chambers of Commerce providing technical assistance and resources to businesses across the US with the US Small Business Administration's SBA Community Navigator Program. Thank you for your assistance in developing and sharing this program. Today, we welcome a presentation by a cybersecurity specialist delving into digital best practices and protections to hedge against current and emerging threats. Our team at USBC, as well as our 20 Navigator Chambers, look forward to being a resource to you and your business as you navigate through this journey. Before we introduce today's speaker, I encourage you to drop your questions into the chat and we will address as many as possible at the end of today's webinar. Mr. Justin Ellerman, Senior Vice President and Advisory Services Team Lead for Wells Fargo's Cybersecurity Client Office Group has 15 years of cybersecurity and privacy experience in financial services. His previous roles include incident response, privacy operations, and cybersecurity strategy. Justin holds an MBA and industry certification such as the Certified Information System Security Professional, CISSP, Certified Information Privacy Professional, US, CIPP, US, GX Critical Controlled Certification, GCCC, and GX Cyber Threat Intelligence, GCTI, and GX Strategy Planning, Policy and Leadership, GSTRT. Mr. Ellerman, welcome. It is an honor and pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. And I will be sharing my screen here uh, before we get started. And hopefully everyone can see it. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you may be located. Thank you for your time today as we discuss how you can protect your growing digital presence in today's evolving cyber threat landscape. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, my name is Justin Ellerman, and I represent Wells Fargo's Information and Cybersecurity Program, uh, leading their client advisory services team. Um, and today, uh, we will be going through different topics to um, discuss how to protect your growing digital presence with, for your small business. Uh, some of the topics we'll be covering today include today's current cyber threat landscape, We'll review some emerging threats, including phishing, business email compromise, ransomware, and some best practices for protecting your small business and accounts, and what to do in the event you're the victim of a cyber attack. But real quick, I just want to cover our disclaimer before starting the presentation. The best practices we're covering today are for informational purposes only. It's not meant to address every cyber risk, and the information discussed today is meant to help our customers protect themselves from cyber risk, as well as highlighting this industry best practices for operating in a more secure manner, manner. We can't cover every cyber risk or mitigation activity, and it's up to all of you to determine what is appropriate given the size and scope of your business. So to level set before, we, before moving on, I'd like to cover some key cyber concepts that you'll be hearing th about throughout today's presentation. Phishing usually comes through email, but can also be carried out through text message known as smishing and over the phone as vishing. I'm sure you're all familiar with what phishing emails are and have probably received many in the past. Essentially, they are used to gain trust, to gather information to carry out further attacks or deliver malware to your computers. Malware is a type of malicious code used to exploit in a known vulnerability to gain access to your systems and is usually delivered through an email link or attachment. Ransomware takes this a step further as ransomware will encrypt all your data and render it useless until you pay a ransom to the bad actors, typically in the form of cryptocurrency. And finally, there is business email compromise where someone takes over an email account to impersonate a known partner 
and supplier to facilitate a fraudulent payment. All of these are related as phishing is typically used as an initial step in carrying out a successful BEC or ransomware attack. And actually nine out of 10 cyber attacks involve phishing emails to some degree. The severity and scope of the, of the threat landscape overall is only expected to grow. Looking at some of the numbers on the screen only emphasizes the state we face today and how serious everyone should be taking the risk, not only with your small business, but in your personal lives as well. The main motive for attackers is usually money and they'll continue to find new ways to create more sophisticated attacks, which in turn increases the risk for all of us. Besides the large monetary impacts caused by cyber threats, the biggest thing to focus on here is how important phishing emails and strong passwords are for protecting your information and accounts. Now, digging into some of the threat specific metrics, we can see how cyber attacks have really taken off during COVID. As there were a lot more opportunities created with people working remotely, strains on the supply chain, and more reliance on e-commerce. And ransomware is a high profile cyber attack that gets covered in the news in what seems a weekly basis. But actually, it's not the most frequent cyber attack. As business email compromise was reported to the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center five times more often last year, the total losses have increased over 40% since 2019. Software vulnerabilities, which is the main method ransomware and malware can penetrate your systems, has significantly risen since 2018. This is mainly due to our connectivity to the internet and reliance on computer software for so much activities in our daily lives. You may wanna to rush to download the newest iOS or application, but many times critical security vulnerabilities are found early on after their release. And phishing, as I previously mentioned, takes many shapes and forms. The end goal is to get as much information from you as possible or trick you into taking an action that will help the fraudsters carry out their attacks. Social media provides an excellent environment for threat actors to collect useful information about a business and their employees. Threat actors can easily gather one piece of data from social media or what is publicly available to gather additional information to build out a sense of trust. And from there, the malicious actors can carry out their attacks. Just be aware of what data about you and your business is out there and how it can be used against you. Phishing emails may be delivered to your inbox to look like any other email, but luckily there are typically some red flags or telltale signs that you're dealing with a phishing email. First, look at the sender's name. An email from a company like Wells Fargo wouldn't have a Comcast.net email domain. It would be from wellsfargo.com. And the same can go for many of your business partners and suppliers. Second, there is usually an immediate or urgent call to action that leads you to lending down your guard or leveraging a person's natural tendency to help and causes you to ignore the warning signs. Lastly, be aware of any links or attachments, especially from unknown recipients. One way to identify a suspicious link is to hover over it and a pop-up will show the URL, the actual URL. If they aren't the same, then don't click on it. If you're questioning the validity of an email from a known associate, the best guidance is to pick up the phone and call to confirm that they actually sent it. Phishing has been on the rise, especially since the beginning of the pandemic, as a vehicle to carry out fraud and cyber attacks. And we'll, and we'll get into some best practices for mitigating the risk on the next slide. So why are we as a society so susceptible to phishing emails? And why are they used so often by threat actors? Well. People have an inherent sense to act when they're asked for help or if they receive an urgent request. Attackers exploit human nature with emails that appear to have a sense of urgency. If something seems suspicious, slow down and take steps to verify the request is legitimate. Oftentimes, there are red flags that indicate a phishing e that a email is a phishing email, which we covered on the previous slide. You should be instructing all your employees that if they see something, say something. Also, no one should be asking for your password ever. If they do, especially from someone claiming to be from your bank, hang up and call the number on the back of your, of your credit or debit card or on your account statement. I can't stress enough how important good password hygiene is to protecting your accounts and information. 
Imagine you rely on Facebook or Instagram for a majority of your marketing. If someone gains, gains access to your accounts, they could ruin the reputation you spent years building with one offensive post. When it comes to passwords, a best practice is, use, is to use a passphrase like, my children's names are John and Sarah, three, five, exclamation mark. Make sure you're using different passwords for each of your accounts, because if they're all the same and one account is hacked or breached, then attackers can get, can get into all your other accounts. To manage passwords for all your different accounts, a password manager like LastPass is a great way to securely keep track of everything without resorting to writing them down on a post-it note. And please, please, please do not use password or one, two, three, four, five as your password. Now having outdated software is like locking all the doors to your house, but leaving your windows open. Exploiting vulnerabilities in outdated software is how malware can get a hold in your systems or networks. Any device that stores or processes data or is used in your business needs to continuously be updated with the latest patches. And the easiest way to do this is configuring your systems to automatically install updates and patches. To go along with a strong patch management routine is having antivirus installed on your computer systems as well. The thing with viruses and malware is that they're always usually going to be a step ahead of the antivirus programs. I'm a sports fan, and an analogy I like to use with antivirus is performance enhancing drugs. Drug testing companies need to know first what to look for and test for, so they need to develop markers in their tests. New performance enhancing drugs are always going to be a step ahead of the test. It's very similar to antivirus. Antivirus companies need to create signatures often known by viruses and malwares to identify and block the malicious software. So if you have outdated antivirus, you have no protection when you or your employees actually accidentally click on a malicious link or attachment in an email. I can guarantee that everyone watching this has used multi-factor authentication at one time or another, whether you realize it or not. When you sign into Google or another account with a password and are given a six digit code to enter, or if you use Face ID on your cell phone, that's multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is when you use more than just a password to authenticate. When you use Face ID, you're using your phone, which is something you have, and you're authenticating with your face, which is something you are. It's the same thing when you put in your password and then a six digit code is texted to your phone or sent to your email. Turning on two-factor authentication is probably the best way to prevent against account takeover or unauthorized access to your accounts or systems. In fact, Microsoft did a study where they determined 99.9% .9 of attacks could have been prevented if two-factor authentication had been turned on. If you're going to have one takeaway from today's webinar, let it be this. Use two-factor authentication whenever possible. In today's threat landscape and how rampant cyber threats and fraud has been, especially since the beginning of the pandemic, it's really not a matter of if, but when you'll be a victim of a cyber attack. As long as there's money to be made through cyber attacks, there will always be bad actors trying to take advantage of you to get it. And these attacks are only getting more sophisticated. No longer are you seeing people receive phishing emails with a ton of spelling or grammatical errors claiming to be from a foreign country who need your help claiming a lottery jackpot. We've seen with large companies that once bad actors get inside their networks, they're patient and they'll sit and wait for 12 to 18 months, just learning where the key data is, who is responsible for what. Many times committing fraud is a full-time job for these bad actors and they're good at it because of all the experience they have taking advantage of human nature and habits they've observed over time. When you're impacted by a data breach, it's so important to have a plan in place so you know what you're going to do. If your business handles and relies on data to operate effectively, it's imperative that you frequently back it up. Just like you're told to back up or keep copies of wedding photos or personal documents you don't want lost or destroyed, it's very similar. Except with just losing family photos, not having backups to your data, your business relies on could have serious implications to your livelihood if something happens to that data. We'll get into a little bit more later on, but one of the best ways to mitigate ransomware, ransomware risk is having complete and easily restorable backups. If all your data is encrypted through ransomware, but you can still get to it through all your backups, then the risk you face is really limited. 
based on the type of business you operate, you should look at having multiple backups stored in the cloud. Also making sure you can restore all your data through the backups is key. If you aren't testing your restoration process or don't know if your backups are working as intended, then there's not much point to having a backup process because you won't be able to confidently rely upon it when you need it most. As I mentioned a couple of slides ago, businesses need to operate as cyber attacks are not a matter of if, but, especially, but when, especially in today's cyber threat landscape. Because that's the unfortunate case, businesses, because that's the unfortunate case, businesses need to plan for when that happens. It's also not just planning for what to do or who you'll contact when you're impacted by a cyber attack, but how you'll continue to operate if one of your key suppliers network is out or you can't complete an order. What if you are a restaurant and solely relied on DoorDash for deliveries and they were unavailable? Having contingencies in place like switching to Uber Eats is key to ensuring the business you've spent so much resources and effort building can still operate. The last thing you want is to be thinking about these types of scenarios or developing a plan when you're in the middle of an incident or a crisis. Develop, develop a plan for the most likely scenarios or for your critical suppliers, practice it, and then communicate it to your staff so they're aware of what to do and who is responsible for what. The FCC has a great resource called Cyber Planner, which can help you get started. In my opinion, I would say that besides enabling multi-factor authentication and having strong password hygiene, being aware of the latest cyber threats and fraud schemes through a strong security awareness routine is one of the most important things you can do to protect your small business. You can easily do this by setting up Google Alerts that send you cyber-related news articles, or you can do your own research. Large organizations like Wells Fargo dedicate entire teams to cyber threat intelligence where they are constantly looking for the latest breaches or tactics being used by malicious actors so they can learn from them and integrate the lessons learned to strengthen their own cyber programs. Then relying this information to your employees is, is just as important because well-informed employees can help identify and prevent many cyber attacks. Employees are usually the first and last line of defense when it comes to many attacks and fraud schemes, especially when so many attacks start through email. Teach your employees that everyone plays a role in protecting your small business from cyber threats and teach them how to spot suspicious emails or requests and how to report them to the appropriate people. Fraudsters are continually adapting their techniques to become more sophisticated based on what works. And you and your employees need to be aware of how, how these attacks are evolving. I know I briefly reviewed what business email compromise is at the beginning of the webinar, but the frequency and cost of BEC scams has significantly increased since the pandemic. What we usually see is that a fraudster will gain access into the email of one of your suppliers or spoof their email to make it look like it's coming from them. Then they will email you that they didn't get their payment or that there's been a change to their payment information. Once you complete the payment to the fraudulent account, it's incredibly difficult to get the money back before it's too late. If you receive a request like this that seems a little suspicious, pick up the phone and call a known contact and don't respond to the email because it's likely compromised and you'll be emailing directly to the fraudster. Here are some tips you can take, help, you can take to help prevent BEC fraud. As I mentioned on the previous slide, if something seems suspicious or out of the ordinary, then reach out to your known contact at your supplier to verbally confirm the request is legitimate. Also. Make a standard practice to verify payment detail changes verbally and have the people review the request or changes prior to making any payments. Also, think about establishing a certain dollar threshold that would severely impact the business if it was lost and have two people responsible for making payments. That's you know $5,000 or $10,000 or it's up to you based on your risk appetite. But doing this doesn't place all the responsibility in one person's hands. You should also make a practice to review your accounts daily to spot any unauthorized activity and definitely take advantage of account alerts to help identify and prevent potential fraud that's in progress. If a, track, if a transaction is unfamiliar, report it right away, as many banks have a one or two statement cycle requirement for reporting fraud. Now we'll be reviewing ransomware. And what is a ransomware? I'm sure you know many of you have heard about it you know, through the news, but essentially it's malware that is typically delivered through a malicious link or attachment via a phishing email 
taking advantage of a known vulnerability. Once an attacker gains access to your network and data, they will encrypt your sensitive data, rendering it useless unless you pay a ransom to obtain the encryption key. The ransom is typically paid in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin because those transactions are virtually untraceable. Most companies end up paying because they can't afford the downtime. And because you're not dealing with the most ethical people, companies only end up getting about two thirds of their data back. As I mentioned, a typical ransomware attack is carried out through a phishing email. The malware gains access to your system, exploits a vulnerability in your network due to an unpatched system or application. It encrypts the data, and then you're locked out of your data until a ransom is paid. Sometimes they'll even put a time limit to pay before destroying all your data just to increase the pre pressure to act quickly. Now we've even start to see double and triple extortion methods where attackers will threat leaking the impacted data or contacting the individuals whose data has been breached. This is why it's so important to have a plan in place to handle attacks like ransomware. With so many companies being targeted and falling victim, you might be wondering what can a company do to protect themselves? Some of the top safeguards include web content filtering, which helps prevent attacks starting through malicious links found in email. Also, one of the most important steps is a robust data backup program, as I mentioned earlier. If all your data is routinely and securely backed up at an offsite location, then if you fall victim, you can just restore it to the most recent backup. The only problem with this is that it can be expensive and time consuming if you don't have a strong backup program that is frequently tested. As I mentioned during the phishing email prevention slide, a strong email proxy is key for stopping ransomware being delivered through phishing emails. And making sure your software and systems are patched against the latest vulnerabilities will prevent the malware from gaining a foothold in your environment by exploiting vulnerability. User awareness training, as I mentioned throughout, is key in, in identifying and reporting potentially malicious emails. And then having a plan in place is one of the top things you can do. Being prepared for the inevitable attack, and what steps you'll take and who you'll engage. We even, we've even seen companies as part of their ransomware playbooks opening a cryptocurrency account because it's incredibly difficult to come up with a million or two in Bitcoin overnight when you have a 24 hour time limit to pay the ransom. So we've covered a lot of topics today and I'm sure you may be a little overwhelmed with all the things you have to think about from a cyber perspective while ensuring your businesses are operating efficiently and profitably. As you start to think about what you should focus on and where to spend your money, it's important to start with a risk-based approach by asking yourself, what are your most important assets that you want to protect? And where can you get the most bang for your buck? Shop around to see what vendor provides the best security features at a reasonable cost. Many internet service providers have security features built into their subscriptions. And the same goes for payment processing companies. Many security providers have bundled packages that give you a full suite of protection for your network and data. So you aren't dealing with three or four different companies. At the end of the day, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate level of control given the, the value of the asset you're trying to protect. Of course, you don't wanna spend $100,000 protecting an asset that's only worth $10,000. I just wanna take a few minutes to summarize some of the key takeaways from today's webinar. Make sure you have strong, unique passwords on all your different accounts. Don't share your credentials with anyone, not even your bank or someone you think you trust. Be wary of email threats, and don't click on links or attachments from unknown or suspicious senders. Suspicious senders. If something is out of the ordinary and it seems suspicious, it probably is. It's incredibly easy to spoof a phone number to make it look like it's coming from a known contact. So feel free to call the person back at the number you have on file. Turn on two-factor authentication and account alerts as an additional layer of security. For high-risk transactions like changing supplier payment details, Make sure two people are responsible for completing them to limit the risk and spotting suspicious activity and confirm the, the payment changes of the phone. I know I've mentioned today that, that today's cyber threat and fraud environment is continuously changing and growing. But fortunately, taking some of the key points from today will better prepare you to mitigate much of today's cyber risk. As we start to wrap up, I wanna provide some additional resources for what you should do if you're the victim or are the target of fraud. Change your passwords immediately. Notify your bank that you're a victim of that you're a victim of fraud as they can take extra precautions like locking your account or adding enhanced fraud monitoring. If you have any evidence of an attack, make sure you're saving it 
for law enforcement to use with any potential prosecutions. If you find yourself to be a victim, make sure you file a report with your local law enforcement and with the FBI through the Internet Crime Complaint Center and with the FTC. My final point is that there's never a finish line when it comes to a strong cybersecurity program or posture, as there are always evolving and emerging threats. So make sure you're always evolving and staying up to date with the latest trends. Now, th uh, and thank you to everyone for your time and attention today, as I know how valuable it is. Now I'll open it up for any questions from the audience. Wow, thank you again for sharing your wisdom on how to protect our businesses from current and emerging uh, threats, cybersecurity. Now, yes, we would like to open the floor to address your live questions. Uh, if you missed the welcome at the beginning of today's webinar, feel free to drop in uh, and chat any of your questions. We have a few. Uh, first, can you tell us, um, can small businesses rely on controls at third-party payment systems like PayPal to prevent cyber fraud, Mr. Elliman? Um, I would say yes and no. Um, obviously, you know, third-party payment processors like PayPal, they have a lot of, they have a lot more resources than a lot of our, you know, a lot of the small businesses may have. So while they are good, they aren't a hundred percent accurate or shouldn't be completely relied upon. Um, if you have any questions, I would definitely reach out to your relationship manager with those payment processing companies and just kind of get more information around what they're doing and how it compares to your other, uh, you know, suppliers or payment processors that may be available in the market. Um, you know, like I said, they have a lot of different resources, uh, a lot more than, you know, the average small business, and they are probably doing a lot, but it's also great to kind of get an overview just so you have a better understanding of what they're doing and kind of how they're handling evolving emerging cyber threats or payment or fraud threats. Fair enough. Knowledge is power. Just keep on doing your homework and asking those questions. Um, next question, quickly, you know, you mentioned playbooks to prepare for cyber attacks. Where can we find play templates? So um, I previously showed a slide that was from the, I believe it was from the FTC or the FCC. Uh, it's called Cyber Planner. And it is, it has different templates and ideas that you can incorporate into your small business for preparing for a, a cyber attack. And, um, you know, a lot of large companies, they have very extensive playbooks and, you know, probably based on, you know, the size and scope of a small business. Um, you know, the biggest thing is to know, you know who you're going to contact in the event of a cyber attack. If it's impacting a key supplier or if it's impacting your business, are you going to be contacting your bank? Are you going to be contacting suppliers, partners? Um, are you going to be contacting your employees, right? Just kind of knowing what steps you'll take is key just so you're not, you know, going through the playbook or trying to come up with the playbook when you're in the heat of an incident, because when an incident is going around or going on, you're probably running around with your hair on fire. And there's just so many things you're worried about and concerned about. And, you know, having a playbook is very important, but also practicing that playbook because you don't want to be dusting it off for the first time or looking at it for the first time when you're in the middle of an incident, you want to be kind of very familiar with it, you know, for you and your employees as well. Okay, excellent. Our final questions, two part question. Uh, Justin, how often should I as a business owner upgrade my equipment like laptops and cell phones to help outpace fraud and cyber attacks is the first part of the question. So I would say, you know, as long as your operating systems can still support you know, the latest patches and as long as those operating systems are still supported by the vendor, right? Um, I know Microsoft comes to kind of an, an end of life or Apple comes to kind of an end of life support for some of their older operating systems where they no longer offer patches at that point that's when it's important to kind of upgrade your systems because if they, if your, um, you know, software companies or operating system companies aren't coming up with the latest patches, then that obviously leaves you vulnerable to attack. So making sure that your systems are still being supported by those uh, companies. And as long as you know your 
you know, equipment and technology can still, um, you know, handle the changes in new technology and keep pace with your growing business. That makes sense. That makes sense. The second part of that question is how often should uh, our companies put our staff through awareness training? Um, yeah, uh, great question. So I know for a lot of companies, they have their employees take annual cybersecurity awareness training. And it's, you know, usually about 60 minutes. Um, but I would prefer that it's quarterly for 15 minutes, right? So it's still 60 minutes, mm -hmm. but it's just more frequent to keep it top of mind for employees. I'd rather kind of have shorter, frequent mm -hmm. kind of touch bases. So, you, you know, you know, kind of serves multiple purposes. One, you're keeping it top of mind for your employees, but also you can kind of keep it up to date on the latest trends and tactics and techniques and attacks that are going on in the environment, right? Because say you give, you know, just look at, you know, 2022 or 2020 for an example, say you provided your employees cybersecurity awareness training in January, and then the pandemic hits in March and the cyber threat landscape completely changes, new frauds are emerging every day, right? then your employees wouldn't be prepared. Where if you're doing that once a quarter, you can kind of update your training based on the, the evolving threat landscape. That makes sense. Being proactive instead of reactive. Yeah, I, I would appreciate that too. Just 15 minutes each quarter is going to be the same time at the end of the year, but we're going to be more on top of it. I promise this is the last question because the <laughs> questions are popping off. This is a hot topic. Um, with social media, what additional risks should businesses be mindful of as we go into the metaverse and Web3? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, for me, and I'm a little bit more conservative in this standpoint, you know, I'd rather be on the, I don't want to be the first one to adopt it and kind of to join, right? Um, because with new technologies, I kind of mentioned during the presentation, there's always vulnerabilities, there's always risks. And if you're the first one to join, um, you know, something like the metaverse or adopt a new technology, all those risks may not be uncovered, right? And I'm sure fraudsters will find a way to monetize and kind of, you know, uh, defraud people on the metaverse. So making sure you're just doing your research, uh, you're doing your due diligence, um, kind of limiting your exposure. Obviously, you know, it, it looks, it sounds like the metaverse could provide an opportunity for businesses, but also you kind of have to, you know, look at the risk reward of that opportunity, right? Uh, you know, what's appropriate for the size and scope of your business? What's your risk appetite? Um, just be careful. I think at kind of at the day, end of the day and just make sure you're doing your research. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for attending How to Protect Your Growing Digital Presence. Each webinar is possible through our work with the SBA Community Navigator Program, funded in part through a grant with the U.S. Small Business Administration and our sponsor, Wells Fargo. Thank you again, Justin. Wells Fargo, our Community Navigator Chambers, for advocating for Black businesses and to you, our viewers, for joining in the discussion. USBC introduced by by Black, the only Black certification program with a business directory, providing businesses that certify access to private and public procurement opportunities, highlights, and other benefits. This online program can help prepare you for the contracting space as a documents preparation guide certified today by visiting usblackchambers.org slash certification. Join us for future events such as U.S. Department of Treasury and USBC's inaugural Access to Capital event, Advancing Small Business Series on August 24th at 10 a.m. East Coast time. Discover to improve contracting success with the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, PTAC, on August 30th at 1130 East Coast time. Navigating Cash Flow Part 1 with Chase on August 30th at 1 p.m. East Coast time. And finally, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets on September 9th, 12 noon, East Coast time. For more events like this, regularly visit and certify for upcoming events at usblackchambers.org slash webinars. Follow us on social media at usblackchambers.org. If today's forum prompted additional questions and interests, 
feel free to contact us at programs at usblackchambers.org. We thank you. Thank you.